Hi, my name is Emma Tierney, and I will be presenting on Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, uh, which comes from the bacteria Rickettsia rickettsi. It was originally emerged in the Idaho Valley in 1896, and it was found. It was researched by Howard Ricketts, who isolated the organism right before he died of typhus. He was known to inject himself with um, the things he was studying in order to track um, their effects and he was studying typhus at the time, so it's thought that he injected himself with typhus and then died of that. By the time of his death, the disease had spread to the Bitterroot Valley, which is in Montana, with an 80-90% to 90 mortality rate. Um, and so Simeon Bert Walbach picked up uh, Ricketts' research and isolated or found the intracellular bacterium Ricketsia Ricketsi. Um, it's from the family Ricketsiaceae. Um, other genuses in other genera in this family are Wolbachia and Orientia. Um, Wolbachia, I think, is really interesting. It's found in arthropods, and it, and it can only be transferred to females. So if it's in a male, it will eat the testes or change the um, the the um, sex of the organism in order to be passed down through generations. And there are two strains, R and HLP. There's no DNA differences between the strains. There's just um, a few epitope differences. So as you can see in this graph, there has been a drastic increase in the number of cases annually. In 1933, there were only 250 cases, whereas in 2008, there were 2,500 cases. And then it dipped down back a little bit um, after that. But as you can see here, the mortality rate has decreased to just about zero. So even though the incidence is very high, higher than it's ever been, um, the mortality rate is very low. And in this next map, you can see that the concentrated um, cases are in uh, these red, darker red areas here. And those are areas where there are very high tick populations. Up here in Montana is the um, the Rocky Mountain tick, which spreads the disease. As I said, there are a, mo a, a list of ticks that can spread the disease through their saliva. There's no human-to-human -human transmission. Um, people who are at res risk are hikers and campers if uh, they need to wear long pants to prevent getting bitten by a tick because there's no vaccination. There's no way to prevent it. Um, they started, they tried to develop a vaccine when um, they first found the disease, but it has been ineffective so far. So it's important to prevent it and remove the ticks. And if you found, find a tick on your pet, remove it with tweezers or at least a Kleenex or something so that you don't risk getting the saliva in your own system. Um, if you catch it within a few hours, it, um, you might not get the infection, but if it's been attached for over 20 hours, it's very likely that you will be infected um, by the tick. Um, some ca characteristics of Rickettsia rickettsi um, are that it's gram-negative, it's coxobacillus, as you can see in this image here on the right. Um, it's very small, about 0.3 to 1 micrometers in size. It's obligately intracellular, so it cannot survive very long outside of the cell. Um, uh, it has two very important outer membrane proteins, OMPA, which helps with um, the attachment to the host cell and OMPB, which forms like a geometrical um, um, surrounding of the cell or an S layer. Um, so that will help for it to evade phagocytes. It also has a lipopolysaccharide plus 17 KDA, which is kind of like a lipoprotein. Um, it helps to stabilize the structure of the um, bacterium. It's um, it can help against chemical attacks on the bacterium, and it also triggers a very high immune response in the body because it's recognized by antibodies. Um, the virulence mechanisms it uses are phospholipase A2 to get out of phagocytes. The type 4 secretion system helps it to enter into the host cell. It's thought to use uh, forms of reactive oxygen to um, kind of cause harm to the cell, its host cell. If it is caught in a phagocyte, it will use the actin tail and it will polymerize that to um, eject itself from the phagocyte. Um, increased vascular permeability is the result of the degradation of the host cell. Um, this can be through any of its um, pathovirulence mechanisms, including these proteases, which will hydrolyze um, proteins in the um, 
cell, which can degrade the membrane and lead to cell death or lysis. And so if there's increased vascular permeability, there will be an increase in the amount of fluid moving into the extravenous space, which can result in hypotension, low blood pressure, or shock from the loss of blood, um, also anemia, a number of things. Um, so as you can see here, it infects the um, endothelium, as I said. And sometimes it will go deeper into the smooth muscle um, um, around the arteries. So um, this infection will um, lead to a number of other complications. So the immune response to this infection occurs three to four days after the body is infected. Um, antibodies will be produced. Um, anti oh, and antibodies for OMPA and OMPB. Um, also, T cells will activate B cells to become plasma cells and release these antibodies. Mm -hmm. They also will release cytokines, um, specifically interleukin-8 um, and monocyte chemoattractant protein-1, which will help with pulmonary and dermal infections, while chemokines will help with cerebral infections. And there's further research going into the immune responses right now. As you can see here, these are two blood vessels. Um, there's the endothelium lining the, the vessel, and the smooth muscle tissue is the wavy-like um, tissue around there, and it's infected with the rickettsia rickettsii. Um, symptoms will occur 2 to 14 days after the bite, and um, they include a long list of symptoms and signs, including fever, headache, um, decreased mental status and hallucinations if the infection gets into the brain or the spinal cord. Um, the rash is definitely um, kind of a, is the main symptom of this disease, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, even though 10% uh, of patients don't even get the rash. It comes two to five days after the infection of the fever. Um, it starts in the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet and can spread to the wrists ankles and your trunk. Um, it's small, it's pink or red to begin with, um, it doesn't itch, and it can develop into like a purple-ish color on the sixth day um, from the blood getting deoxygenated. Um, that signifies the severity of the disease. That's why it was originally called the black measles because that purple rash kind of looked um, black. And if it's not treated at this sixth day of infection where it turns black, it can lead to severe brain damage, um, a long list of things including partial paralysis, um, kidney failure, um, heart failure, loss of hearing, meningitis, um, shock, a number of things. So it's important to diagnose it earlier, even though this can be difficult because if you have, if, especially if you don't have the rash because if you just have fever and um, a headache and vomiting, it could be the flu. Um, it, it, if you have the rash, it could be thrush. It could be anything. So it's important to really take a closer look. It's important that the doctor asks the patient if they have been hiking recently or if they've removed ticks from their children or from themselves um, so that they can really pinpoint the disease. Um, signs of the disease are low platelets, low sodium levels, um, elevated liver enzymes such as alanine, aminotransferase. These can be um, found in a skin biopsy or urinalysis, also in testing of kidney function. Um, also, if you take a prothrombin time, you can see the decreased number in platelets. Um, if you take uh, an immunal histochemical staining to look for or do a PCR assay to look for the genomic evidence of the um, rickettsial um, bacteria. Also commonly used to diagnose this disease is the indirect immunofluorescence assay, which will show a fourfold increase in the IgG antibodies and will sometimes show an increase in um, IgM antibodies also. So as I said, it's very treatable. That's why the mortality rate is so low at this point, because we can treat it now with doxycycline is the main antibiotic that will wipe out this virus or this bacteria. Um, first of all, remove the tick if it has not been removed yet to um, stop further infection. Um, also, tetracycline and chloramphenicol are used to 
um, against this bacteria. But chloramphenicol is specifically used in pregnant women. Um, I'm not sure what the difference is there. Um, but doxycycline should wipe it out. They would be an inpatient with um, continuous IV um, and monitoring, but only 3 to 5% mortality rates in the last five years. So it's a good outlook. And right now there's a lot of research going into a cross-protective response, looking at um, certain antibodies that are non-pathogenic, or antigens that are non-pathogenic but similar to the antigens found on Rickettsi. So um, they, that could help, but it hasn't yet um, because the passive transfer of that immune serum has not um, protected from infection as a whole. And the IgG2A has the high binding affinity for those bacterial proteins, so since they know that, um, they can maybe develop that into a... Um, into a antiserum in the future, but they haven't yet. So there's also an increase um, in the recognized tick-associated rickettsial pathogens. Um, they're mentioned on my earlier slide. They include rickettsia australis found in Australia, and it um, causes Queensland tick typhus, and also rickettsia africae, which is native to Africa and causes African tick bite fever. There's about there's a list of about 20 of these um, bacteria that cause tick-borne. Um, diseases and scientists are concerned about the number of diseases happening worldwide, not only in America but also in Asia and Australia, Africa, Europe, everywhere. So that's definitely a concern and there's research going into it right now. Other than that, um, there's a lot of research going into the immune response to the bacteria and the viral mechanisms, but that's all I have to report on the disease so far. Thank you.